gifts. So he calls you to do what he knows he can enable you to do. Did you hear that? He calls you to do what he can enable you to do. He doesn't call you to something that he can't enable you. We are in the ministry of reconciliation. We'll do this. I know either you guys are faithful or you didn't watch the weather forecast. One or the other. Um, I think you're faithful. <laughs> What'd you say? Both. <laughs> you're faithful and didn't watch the weather forecast. Good, good. And we need to record this because we're, we're making this a, a, a series uh, for uh, those who are following us on the Ministry of Reconciliation. So whether there was anybody here or not, I was still going to record so, so we could have that uh, for our series. And uh, so 2 Corinthians 5, we've been going through that passage. And you, don't, you can turn there if you want, but I'll just reiterate it. About the Ministry of Reconciliation, we've laid it out. How our heart is to be reconciled back to the Father fully in order to get back to what God created each of us, not just Adam and Eve, each of us to be from the garden, from the very birthing of mankind in the earth, God intended for us uh, to have everything that was written about us. Now, remember, I said it last week, you were in the heart of the Lord. You were in him before the foundation of the world. We were in Christ. We saw the future in the spirit realm. I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain that theologically. Uh, I've, I've had people leave the church by my, me even saying that. They said, you're a heretic. You can't say that. Well, I didn't. The scriptures did, all right? So they don't believe that was, uh, you know, and, and so because what they think, some people think is if we knew that, we knew what life we would have, and that means that we chose to come and maybe we chose to be born in a bad family. We chose to be raped. We chose to be attacked. You know, and, and I don't believe that. I don't, and whether that's true or not, I don't know. But the fact is, I, I, I know that Jesse DePlantis, in his encounter at the throne, he could hear the Spirit saying, please send us into the earth. We want to be redeemed. Because one thing about angels that do not experience what we do is redemption. And they can't understand why the Father has so much love for us. There's no way that they can understand it because they've never experienced it. You understand that? So they watch the Father. That's why it says in Ephesians 3.10 that the manifold wisdom is revealed through the church, the ecclesia, to the powers, to the, the spirit realm. Because they can't figure out why God would love such a destitute people. Why he would love people that sin. Come into the world sinning. If you've ever had a baby... If you've ever been a child, you came here knowing how to sin. <laughs> no training necessary. You know, you're, you're one year old and you already know to lie, steal, hit, cry to get your way. You, you know all these things and you just get here. <laughs> and parents scratch their heads and go, how did you learn that? You know, I didn't teach you that. And it's because that's sin nature. That I put in there. So God wants to redeem that and get that sin nature out of us, redeem it so that we are the righteousness of Christ and so much so, and that's the ministry of reconciliation, to get us back, and it says in Ezekiel 36, that the Spirit will cause us to keep the ways of God. In other words, you won't have to work at it in a religious fashion. The Spirit will cause you to do the things of God. That's why it says you walk in the Spirit, right? You'll not give in to the lust of the flesh. Well, if I've not been redeemed enough, my flesh still wants to do what it wants to do. So I've got to get, I got to get in the ministry of reconciliation to be reconciled back to where I was spirit-directed, spirit-led the, before the foundation of the world. And it's possible. Hallelujah. That's why Paul could say, no longer I live. Galatians 2.20, he could not have said that if it were not true. It would not be in Scripture. It, it, and because he did, he was crucified with Christ. He no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. Oh, that's what I want. Wouldn't it be nice that you, instead of you saying, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, <laughs> and come into a place like I have no desire to do it, I don't even think about doing it, it doesn't even enter my mind to do it, that's the ministry of reconciliation. And if we're not there, then we're still in the sanctification process. 
Okay, and that's okay too. Here's the thing, you're going to heaven either way, but your placement in heaven is based on how sanctified you become. This is clear in Scripture. God is not going to change his nature just because we cross over. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, you guys that, that live like hell as Christians, you get to go to the front of the class. And that's not how it works. That's why he calls paradise for the least. The man on the cross, paradise. He barely made it. And what did he do? He went in there to learn. The, he may still be there even today, 2,000 years ago. He may be learning some basics right now today. That's where they have seen, many people in heaven that have seen the aborted babies and the miscarried babies. They go straight to paradise, and they start learning what they couldn't learn here because they never had a chance. And God in his mercy teaches them there. Whew. Man, when I was in, in Colombia, because uh, they have a real issue with abortion and death, uh, a lot of death, they have lots of miscarriages. So we were praying about that, and the Lord clearly showed me there was going to be double mantles on the next babies. In other words, they were going to have their own mantle, and they're going to carry the mantle of an aborted or miscarried child. And their children will have that, and what will happen is they wonder, why does this child act really outside the family culture? It's because they're carrying the mantles from somebody else. Boom, boom, double barrel. How about that? So then we're supposed to reconcile others back to that place. So when you have a friend, a loved one, a lost person, whoever, especially, maybe let's say they're believers, and you know they're not walking in what they're supposed to be doing, you have to have the passion and you have the ability to represent Christ to hopefully to get them reconciled to Christ, to where they're walking in what they were called to walk in. That should be your passion. That's why we prophesied over 300 people this weekend. Because our heart is to give somebody a directive so they make sure they're getting back to what they were born to do so they can get back to fullness of what God created them to be. That's why we prophesy. I, I don't prophesy hardly to any, uh, rarely to anybody without telling them what their purpose is on the earth. Now, sometimes I just, they need to know the love of God. They need to know God cares about them, wants to heal them. I get that. But if I don't shoot them to the future, then what kind of a prophet am I? if I'm not speaking of a future thing to get them back to what God made them to be. Amen. I mean, if this place was packed, they'd be screaming. Anyway, all right. So we're going to talk about your call tonight and your prophetic. What do you all think of when I say, what is my call? What, what, what does that word mean to us? Purpose. What's that? Purpose. What else? Assignment. That's a good way of looking at it. Okay. You know, some evangelicals say, look, there's no need working in personal desire. Just do the stuff of the Bible. Okay, I get that. I get that. I don't have a problem with that. But then why did he say all the days about our life were written in a book before there was ever one of them? Why did he say before we were in our mother's womb, he appointed us to be? Okay, so, so there's a whole challenge there that evangelicals will, will not let you. They say you're too focused on yourself. Well, I get that you can become too focused on yourself. I'm not going to say there's not a a level of truth in that. But the fact that if I don't focus enough on my call, I'll never be reconciled fully, and I'll still be wondering what, is, I'm, what am I doing here? And what is my ultimate goal in life, all right? And so until you found that place, you'll never be fulfilled as a believer. Can I say that? You will never be fulfilled as a believer. God has a place for each one of us and each one of you here tonight, every one of us. If you're watching online, same for you. He has a place of employment or a place of service for you. Thank God for that. He has a place of the body of Christ. He also has geographical locations. And I spoke about that whenever sometime I was filming or recording or something this week. That is the problem with this mass migration that's going on in the world. Is because now you have people out of their places who were destined to save a nation maybe, and now they're in another nation, and they bring their gods with them to that nation. So now you're diluting the purpose of the nation that they went to, and you have made a, a vacuum in the nation they're supposed to be in. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some people supposed to come, because there are. And everybody's quoting the scripture, well, we're supposed to take care of the sojourners, the aliens among us, because we were once aliens, speaking of Israel and Egypt. 
But when you study in Leviticus what a sojourner is, a sojourner is somebody who wants to partner with the God of that land and wants to partner with the laws of that land and wants to help build that land and not be a deterrent. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus, it says if they don't, they're an alien, you're to remove them from among, amongst you. So when Muslims, for the most part, come here, they don't come here to worship a, a Christian God. They come here to Islamify, Islamify our nation because they have a kingdom mentality, the kingdom of Islam, but they have a kingdom mentality that they believe the world should be like them. That happened in Germany. When we were there, we see it clearly. Merkel, who was the prime minister, felt the migration or the immigration of all the Muslims from the Middle East, that they would come to Germany and they would fall in love with the German culture. They would realize how wonderful it was and they would assimilate. So they, they, they did this. You could, they began to put them all over the country. They separated them so they couldn't be together. They made them live in other cities all over the country, but they could, and they were not allowed to move for one year. This was the law. So they did this. These Muslims did this for one year, and after one year, they all found each other and started building communities. And the next thing you know, they started bringing Islam to all those communities. Almost all the crimes, especially violent crimes in Germany and most of Europe now, is from the radical Islamic people that have moved there. And then so they change the laws in Germany and other countries, and they say... You can't, the police cannot report the, the ethnic background of the person committing the crime. So you'll hear a 25-year-old German rapes a woman. They won't say a 25-year-old Islamic uh, immigrant from Syria raped a woman. They won't say that. So you don't know who's doing what. So they're hiding the fact that their plan failed. Okay, uh, um, that was nothing to do with what I'm preaching about. All right. Well, it has to do with geographical location. Okay. And in and, and, and Acts 17, it says, in the, that's where God puts you, and that's where you will find him. That's what it says. You'll grope like in the dark, and you'll try to find him, and then you'll find in him you live and move and have your being. So if you're not where you're supposed to be geographically, you're not going to find the Lord. That's why there's such misery of living in the wrong place. What's that? Uh, that's in Acts 17, somewhere in teens, somewhere around 20s or something like that. It's on the top right side of my Bible. I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. Right. <laughs> you know, you ever do that? I can't remember the exact uh, address, but there it is, Acts 17. But um, in the book of Proverbs 27, 28, it says, a man who sit, who, uh, maybe the wrong verse, but it's in Proverbs. It says, a man who is out of his place is like a bird who wanders from his nest. You'll never flourish until you find your place. Did you hear that? You'll never flourish until you find your place. So you're like a bird. <laughs> That's what it says. It, 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 that who is out of his place is like a bird who wanders from his nest. And that's what, what happens when people are not living and doing what they're called to do. When you are not saved, we say you're lost, right? We talked about that last week. And we should all be a healthy member of the body of Christ, each one of us. That's what it means to be found. In 2 Timothy, the first chapter, it says this, God has saved us. Thank God for that. Amen. Um, I can't remember the verse. It's 2 Timothy 1. Um, it says, God has saved us. I have it written down in my notes. There it is. Um, well, verse 9. It says that um, God has saved us, and he's called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he granted us in Christ Jesus from all of eternity. Now, get this. There's no pause in between God saved us and has called us. It's one of the same. So when you get saved, you get called. There's no pause there. Get saved. Now let me go find my calling. God says, no, you get saved and you're called. That's what it means to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, old things pass away. All things become new because now I have a new purpose in life. I'm not just born again. I have a calling. I have a purpose in my life. And that's what reconciliation is because the person who is not saved does not know their calling. 
Now, they may be doing close to it because there's some passion in them, but they still don't know why they're doing it. Why am I doing this? Why am I a businessman? Why am I, a, a, you know, an IT person? I don't know. I'm just doing it. But all of a sudden you get saved and all, oh, that's why. I'm doing it for this reason, to help these people, to serve these people, to have a light in this place. It starts coming. It starts happening to you. So when you're saved, you get a calling. And on top of that, um, it's holy. Now, now that one just blew me away right there. It says it's wonderful to be called by God, but do we understand that it's holy? And this is where I think so many believers are making a huge mistake when they don't embrace their calling. They have not honored it as holy. They have made it profane. Like, ah, maybe I'll do it, maybe I don't. I've had guys, I've prophesied to people, and I, they have tell me, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I said, bro, I gave a guy a prophetic word that he, about business. He was doing a business. It wasn't going well. The Lord gave me a dream and told me how he could get out of it and prosper, and it would be part of his calling. I prophesied to him. I said, bro, I had a dream for you. I told you, God showed me what you're called to do. This is it. You're going to sell, da, da, da. I gave him exactly what to do. And I thought, well, good, because he was in a bind. He was in a bad place. And I remember I stood by that door over there on the other side of the building. And he says, if you think I'm going to do that on a dream, you're crazy. And I said, well, I'm telling you, it was the Lord. And he goes, I'm not doing something like that on a dream. And I said, Okay. And he didn't listen. He failed, went bankrupt, and lost everything. And got lost as a goose because he didn't know what to do then. Didn't know where he was, didn't know where to go because he wouldn't listen because he didn't honor it as holy. And when God gives us a call, it's holy. That's why hell comes to people running from their holy calling. And when you run from it, or like it's, I, have a, I have a certificate for that, and, 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 and it, it is a horrible place to be. But when you get in it, it's such peaceful. It's such peace. Even if you're not successful. <laughs> it's better to be a failure doing what you're supposed to be doing than be a success is something you're not called to do. You understand? I remember, you've heard my testimony about tithing. When I wasn't tithing and the Lord gave me an audible voice, said tithe. And I remember this statement came to me. I feel I was going to lose everything. I was going bankrupt. I'm going to lose the house. I'm going to lose the cars. I'm going to lose everything. And I, heard, I remember this statement came to me. Well, if I go under, at least I go under with God. <laughs> and that gave me the unction to be obedient. And I figured I might as well be poor with Jesus and rather be being poor without him. Because <laughs> at least if I'm poor with him, he's with me in my poverty. Because Paul declares that, right? Whether I've had much or I have little, I find content in all things talks about in Philippians so we can have that place and I, I I just want if I could do anything if I could stop tonight right now Lord thank you for the rain stopping I'd say this honor your calling as holy honor as holy and that God atoned for that your life died for your calling as much as he died for you you understand that he died as much for your calling as he died for you. Because he saved you, he called you with a holy calling. So Jesus, when he died for you, because right, he was slain before the foundation of the world. He loved you before you first loved he loved you before you first loved him. He, he died for your sins while you were yet a sinner, right? He was not just thinking about your salvation, he was thinking about your purpose. He had already thrown you out there in the future once you got saved. You looked much better in the future than you looked right then, all right? And so he wants to get you to the future, but he knows he's got to save you, so he does, and then he, boom, he puts a calling in you. Isn't that amazing? Philip, remember, and, and, and he's one of the, the first deacons, as we say in Acts chapter 6. He gets this anointing, gets called to be a deacon in the church, amen, and the next thing you know, they call him an evangelist. The next thing you know, he's being translated. He's ministering to the Ethiopian, remember? And he gets translated to another place. That's the airlines I want to get into. I'm just into that, man. Because I told him, I said, man, 
I got invited to Peru, to Brazil, all these places this time. I said, look, here's what I'll do. If I can be translated every night, I'll come. But as long as I go back home after the service, <laughs> that's, that's all. <laughs> I'll just come every night. That's what I'll do. I'm tired of flying. Anyway, so <clears throat> it's wonderful. This is wonderful. The calling has absolutely nothing, it says here, it has absolutely nothing to do with your abilities. Any abilities you have that fits your calling is because when he created you, he put them in you so you could walk in that calling. So you can't take any credit for it. I'm just naturally good at numbers. That's why I'm a CPA. No, you're not. God gifted you when he created you in the secret place, and he gave you a mind for numbers. And you don't know why. You think, I'm just a freaking genius. You know, I don't know. I made straight A's in, in math. I just, it was so easy to me. I can't understand these stupid people that don't understand this. And what they don't understand is that that was a gift that was for their calling. It was holy. And there they are being arrogant and prideful about a gift when it was from the Lord. And they're not deeming it as holy. They're deeming it as their own intellect. Any good thing you can do. Hmm? Well, I studied for that. I tested for that. Well, amen. Where'd you get the drive? Where did the drive get inside of you? It came because God created you and made you with that drive so you'd fulfill your call. <laughs> Anybody who takes any credit is a fool. <laughs> Let me read it again. Not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity before we were even here. Naturally, we were in eternity because we were in him, and he put it all in there. Ooh. Now, I, I agree we encourage people and honor them, and, hey, you did wonderful and all that. And, and we don't want to be stupid and say, well, it's only Jesus, you know. Well, it wasn't that good. But, it, you know, it's, it's one of these things that whatever good we can do, we have to understand it was a gift from God. Okay? All right. When you walk in this calling, it will be similar to f like a fish swimming in water. It's natural. And I, I think that's something that it's not that it won't be hard. I mean, a little fish, I guess, has got to learn to fish and we'll swim. But uh, I remember when I took swimming in YMCA when I was a kid, you, the first level was tadpole. <laughs> the, then they'd go, you'd be a minnow, and then you'd be a fish, and a flying fish. You'd go through this old thing, you know, and it was okay, but it was a picture of progress. It's a progression. You started as a frog, and you become something powerful, you know, whatever. Uh, no, we weren't frogs. I don't believe in evolution, and da 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 Just make sure you understand that, Okay. So when you're not in your calling, you're like a fish out of water. There you are flopping around, trying to make it happen, and wondering why you can't breathe. Why am I suffocating all the time? Because you're not supposed to be there, and you're not doing what you're called to do. You'll be drawn to learn and study that what you're called for. You'll, you'll be drawn to learn and study what that what you're called for. You don't know why? You're just drawn to that. You know, I'm in the political arena. I'm drawn to learn about politics. I'm drawn to learn about uh, law and how it functions. Why? Because God has a calling for us to be in that arena. Everybody's like, I'm glad you read that stuff. I don't want to. You know, <laughs> amen. It's not your call. And God put the passion in it. We have people that watch us on our pipeline stuff that tell us, we don't watch any news. We just watch you guys. <laughs> because they have no desire to look at all that stuff. And so we're giving them the important stuff. And that's very important. Because we want them to be on mark of what the Lord's doing in the earth. Okay? All right. Um, so it'll be natural. It'll be a natural hunger for you to be drawn and learn and study the things that you're called to. You don't know why. Maybe you just study, like Randy Grigsby studies history all the time. Why? Because he's writing books about history. <laughs> he's getting on our live streams and telling people what happened in the past so we won't make the mistake now. You understand? That's why he can't read enough. Teachers are that way. If you're a true teacher, uh, like a redemptive teacher, and that's your call, 
you can't get enough information. You just, like, you're a vacuum. You just, uh, just suck in as much information as you can get. You don't know why you want to read some more, so much. And then you have this gift to take all that information and make it clear to everybody else. You can take volumes and volumes of information and in 20 minutes teach people what you studied in volumes and volumes and volumes. I love it. <laughs> I remember when I was in, in the cardiology and they were teaching algorithms and they had this nurse teaching us, and she was not a teacher. And the more she taught, the more the class would get confused. And I'm like, what is she doing up there? And she's acting like we were idiots because we couldn't get it. And there was nurses. There was all sorts of people in there, and we couldn't get it. And then uh, this one lady, I remember Inez, her name was Inez. I'll never forget her. Kernick. Do you, you remember Inez? she come in there, and she could make mud clear. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I walked out of that. And I understood algorithms within two sessions because she had a gift. That's what she's called. Now that she was lost, she didn't know Jesus. She had some issues in her life, but nonetheless. All right, does that make sense? Um, and that's how we ought to treat our calling. We need to understand that, that we understand it. Paul uses secular terms. When he talks about athletes, remember when Paul talks about athletes? They go through what, all this stuff in order to achieve this natural award, uh, to their crown. You know, you think about a, a, an Apple Olympic athlete and what they go through in order to be in the Olympics. In order, they have to discipline themselves all the time. They devote themselves. Um, they have to, to tailor their whole life in order that they become better at what they're called to do, what they're, what they're running for in the Olympics. That's what they do. Um, and... and and they're motivated and they're directed to do that because they want to be the best. Uh, you know, a person who has no ambition is probably never going to make that much progress in life anywhere, anyway. So an unmotivated person is really a disaster. You need to be motivated, and the best way to be motivated is towards your call. And, and the thing is that when, when Paul was talking about that, he said that benefits some but what you do in the Lord has a greater benefit. And so you do physical things. Yes, you want to take care of your body. You want to do certain things like that. But how much more should we be disciplined in our spiritual body and our spirit man, feeding it the things it needs to be eating rather than just trying to become a better athlete? You understand what I'm saying? And that can, that can consume you. And if you're called to do that, amen. What I love about sports sometimes and some of the best sport pieces, most of them are Christians. It's weird. And they, they give their testimony, which is driving the media crazy. You know, like, oh, no, here they're going to go. They're going to talk about Jesus again. You know, and it's because God has favored them in those places, right? All right. Almost every man in the Bible whom God calls, now listen to me, almost every person in the Bible that God calls, immediately they protest. <laughs> yeah. that, does that sound familiar? So if you've protested what God's asked you to do, it's a good sign because you and your spirit man actually know what it's going to cost. And you don't want to do it. So we talked about last week. Remember the 10 spies? They didn't want to go into the promised land because they knew the price it was going to take to stay in the promised land. Whereas out there in the wilderness, we're on the nipple. You got to understand this. The Jordan, when they were going to cross Jericho, when they were looking at, at that place to go and take the land, and Kadesh Barnea, I should say, there was no difference in the environment of where they were and what was on the other side. As far as the lusciousness and everything that was going on the land, it was, it's, it's just a, it's a line, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, all of a sudden, milk and honey, oh, there's nothing here. No, there's plenty in both places. But the fact is God's will was there, and they'd rather stay here because over here I get the nipple, I get fed all the milk and all, all the, the manna and all no, no sickness. If I cross this line, then all of a sudden i got to fight demons. i got to fight the enemy. I have to sow. I have to plant. I have to go to work every day. i, I got to do all these things. i got to face people who will reject me. i got to do all. Yeah. yeah, we'll just stay over here. Forty years that decision cost. Forty years and a whole generation. A whole generation. And we don't want to lose generations, right? We don't want to go down that place where we have that. We're losing generations. So 
so Paul says this, athletes do it to obtain corruptible crowns. They get a wreath or whatever that's going to wither. But he says that we are going, we're doing it for incorruptible crown. That's what we're going after. So that should motivate us because our calling is holy. You understand? I'm getting a holy reward for walking in my call, which is what he died for, which is going to reconcile me back to the Lord at what I was meant to be. And I'm not going to enter into the ministry of reconciliation until I'm in my call. The longer you run from your call and stay out of it, the longer it takes you to be reconciled. Okay. You see, you need some ambition, you know, holy ambition. How about that? Let's call it that. Uh, if it's rightly motivated and directed, a person who has no ambition is probably never going to make any progress whatsoever. We've got to get there. Almost every man, like I said in the Bible, protested their call. What did Moses say? I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. I'm finding somebody else. Look, this dude was the most educated, powerful, royal man in probably the world. And he starts protesting. So if he did it, you probably will do it as well. I want to give you assurance that God knows you better than you know yourself. I assure you. He knows you better than you know yourself. You scratch your head and like, God, I can't believe you're asking me to do this. I can't believe this is the, no way. You've got to find somebody better. You know? Isn't that funny how the, you have, have, have measured yourself, but God has measured you so well that he identifies your call is better than others because he says that you have the ability that I put in you from the foundation of the world. Now, here's the thing. Many times you don't manifest it until you get in that place. You understand? So you're outside of it. You're not in the will of God. When you get in it, all of a sudden it just starts flowing. It just starts happening. That's what happened to our team down there. We had some guys, first time they ever prophesied, really, basically, in, a, in that setting. They said, they, said, they walked up to me, I can't believe how it's flowing. I'm just like, I can hear very clearly here. I was like, everything I'm hearing, it just like, psh, just flows out of my mouth. And I said, you're in your calling. This is what you're born to do, that you may all prophesy. That's what the Scripture says, right? And so they're like, ooh, this is pretty good. You know, we'll see how they do when they get home, but we're going to pray for them, right, that it just keeps flowing. And, and I want to give you that assurance. So he calls you to do what he knows he can enable you to do. Did you hear that? He calls you to do what he can enable you to do. He doesn't call you to something that he can't enable you with. This wonderful coffee shop, Emily over there, she's amazing. You're called to do it, Emily. It just like flows. I watch her and go, how does she do that? When she sat down and talked to me and Susan when we first started, all the things she's going to have to put in there and all the, the charts, I'm like, me and Susan's eyes are... <laughs> what, what, what are you talking about? And it made total sense to her, and we're like, that, I couldn't get out of the room fast enough. <laughs> Susan loves all that stuff. You know, she's all in the, I, I just like, but it made sense to her. She understand the flow and how that worked, and, and it's doing very well. Bless you, Emily. And you're called, don't you dare leave. Amen. <clears throat> all right? So <laughs> uh, it's not on your own ability. You're provided the grace because it's holy what it says there in, in, in the Second Timothy. So a calling always comes with the holiness of the Father. When it's holy, you'll, you'll keep it pure. When you walk in it, it's holiness. It's not your own ability. So every time you begin to depend on your own ability, you're going to be in trouble. That's where pride will slip in, right? Oh, I'm good at this. I got it rolling, you know? That's that, for us preachers, that's when we lay an egg when we preach. Our you teacher, remember we talked about this before, right? All of a sudden, you're just like, what happened? And God says, well, use what happened. You got in there and thought you could do it. <laughs> so I just let you go ahead and do what you need to do. And all of a sudden, your brain's, your brain's blank. You can't remember. All your thoughts are gone. <laughs> They're everywhere. You may do that at work, wherever you are. If, when you get in pride, that's what happened. How many of you all know that, right? <laughs> so another glorious fact about your calling is that this purpose and grace God was given us was before time began. I think that's the beautiful part of this. Can your mind conceive that? Can I ask you that? Can you conceive that before 
creation that God already put this in you before there was a world, before he created anything. He knew you. Christ had a plan for you. You were just a speck in his eye, as we say, a gleam, just a thought, a process. And one thought of God will give you everything you need to do to do everything you're called to do. Just one thought. He knew you in Christ and had a plan for you. That was before the world started. How much more now? <laughs> you, do you see how important you are? Do you understand how important you are? And here's the kicker. He didn't pick some people and, not other, and, and, and forget, forget others. He did this for everybody, lost or saved. He did it for everybody because he's a just God. And the people who reject Christ reject a holy calling. That's why in Romans 1, it says that every man will be without excuse. Well, God, you never gave me a purpose. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, you never called me. Oh, I called everybody if they would get saved. Okay. And, and thank God for all his backup systems, right? <laughs> so when we don't, aren't obedient to do something, God has backup systems to make sure somebody else does what we should have done. Thank God. There will be nobody in heaven that will have to say, well, my Christian friend didn't tell me about Christ. That's why I didn't get saved. It's not true. It says every man will be without excuse. So as, as a Baptist, they used to put that guilt on us. If you don't witness, they're going to hell. That's what they tell us. And like their salvation depended on my obedience. <laughs> I was like, no, that was a bit... Uh, you know, I, I felt like should give baggage with us so we could carry baggage, you know, with us at all times for our disobedience, you know. The fact is God has a way to reach every human being, right? Are y'all with me? Okay, so there's no such thing as an insignificant Christian. Absolutely. So when people are, in, you know, in a bad place and they don't find purpose, whatever, uh, they, we need to understand there's no insignificance in anybody. Everybody has a purpose. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're the toe, the big toe, you're the behind, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. You have a call. Just, just hold that in your heart. God's special plan and purpose for each one of us. It started in eternity. Romans 8 tells us this. First of all, God foreknew you. Thank God. Secondly, he chose you. And then third, he predestined you. Now, we've talked about the predestination thing because there's, you know, Calvinists, hyper-Calvinists believe that God chose some people and didn't choose others. You know, when he put people in the earth, and you're good, you're bad, you're good, you're bad. And so they don't even see a need to witness. And there's they're what we call hard-shell Baptists. There, there's a lot of them in this region. There's quite a few of them in this region. And they see no need to witness. It's all, it's all predetermined. We're just kind of robots just walking. Remember that old Pink Floyd, just bricks in the wall? You remember that old song? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know that song? Yeah. All right. We went and saw that movie when it came out. Man, I was in Bible college. I'll never forget. And the guy next to me goes, we got to preach after this. He said, this, this is the worst thing we've ever seen because you were hopeless when you came out of that room. So he, started, he stood up and started talking about Jesus. Y'all need Jesus. Don't listen to Pink Floyd. Anyway, um, um, anyway, so God foreknew us. That means he worked out the course of your life and it was to, what your life was to take. Yes, but you still have free will. He's still sovereign, but you still have free will. And you can choose not to do that, even though he predestined. Now, get this. Every person in hell was predestined to do good works. Every person in hell had a call. Hitler was called to be an apostolic leader to take nations for the kingdom. Instead, he took it for evil. I tell that to my German friends. I said, look, this nation is an apostolic nation, and they have so much shame from the war that they refuse to walk in it. And so, therefore, many Germans are lost as far as their purpose. I'm always over there pushing them. Take the nations. You got all the money here. You got, you got all the resources. You're smart. Do this. Go after it. They're like, well, we just, little Germans will tell me. They'll go on vacations, places, and people ask them what nation they're from, and they refuse to tell them Germany. They're so ashamed of their history. And they need to embrace it. Look, we were evil, but God has redeemed us. 
and we're back in our call. Japanese, the same thing. They're the same. They're both apostolic nations. Those two nations are probably the two most apostolic nations in the world. And they're the two nations not doing their apostolic work because of their shame. All right? So, um, let's hurry up before it starts raining again, all right? Um, that means he worked out the course of your life and, from the very beginning. Ephesians 2.10, it says, of those of us who have received Jesus as our Savior, we are his workmanship. So you're more than just a piece of work. Okay, you understand that? Workmanship. Go study the, the, the word, the Greek word there. That is an amazing word. It goes back to Psalms 139 about how he's an architect. He weaved and made us, put everything we needed in us. We are his workmanship. Have you ever seen a craftsman do something? You know, and they just, they want it to be perfect. There's nothing worse than a contractor goes, oh, that's good enough. What if God did that for you? Well, that's good enough. <laughs> now, you understand that? He didn't make you halfway, right? He made I love perfectionists that work on my house. You know, some of them have performance issues and they need to be delivered. I get that, but I want them delivered after they finish my house, <laughs> all right? You finished? Okay, let's pray for you. <laughs> but the point, the point is that God perfectly made us in the secret place. Psalms 139, 15, 14, right around there. It talks about that, that we were perfectly made. Our soul, and you've heard me teach on this many times, our soul and our body was not there. It was just our spirit man. So there was no darkness allowed. There was no error. There was no sin. We didn't have a sin nature in our spirit man. We have it in our soul and our body. So when we got attached, when the soul and the body got attached to our spirit, that's where the corruption came in. But the spirit was still not corrupted. The soul and the body were. That's why we believe, according to Ecclesiastes, at the end, even a lost person, that spirit was on loan, and they didn't use it, so it goes back to heaven. Yeah, it's in Ecclesiastes. It's one of the, the spirit returns the Lord, it says. I think it's one of the last chapters of Ecclesiastes. The spirit is on loan to an individual. If they get saved, it becomes their own. It comes into union. Okay? This is what we believe theologically. And what happens if a lost person, that spirit goes back to the Lord, and their soul and the body goes to hell. Now, they have no memory. This, the spirit man has no memory there. It's gone. It was just a gift from God. So the gift that we all have is his spirit in us all. That's a gift. That's your conscience. That's why you know that's wrong. Because it's a spirit from the Lord. It came from him. All right? Isn't that good? That he gives it to us and then it becomes ours. Hallelujah. It says we, he said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared that we should walk in them. God before prepared them. Every good thing you do was already pre-prepared. We were in Colombia. I had so many, because I was kind of lost for the first day or so. Because I was like, what am I here for? Oh, Lord, I know I'm supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. John and Scott were blowing it up. And I, I just didn't, I had a prophetic word of what we were supposed to do. So I, I gave them and they ran with my prophetic word and just knocking it out of the park. And I'm like, what about me, Lord? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I give it to my bros and they're taking it, you know. And they did. They did exactly what the prophet, I had a dream before we went and the Lord told them what to do, and we did. And then all of a sudden, my, the time came for me, and the next thing you know, things exploded. Everything came in line, okay? It was already prepared. I knew I was supposed to be there. Everything was happening. I mean, literally, me and Scott said, hey, we need to cover this now. We, we've talked to each other, and then all of a sudden, John would be on the platform and just covered the very thing we just talked about. I said, okay, well, that's taken care of. You know, and the next thing you know, Scott would be up there, and John said, we need to cover this, and then Scott would say it. i go, well, that's taken care of. You know, it was just like one confirmation after another that we were right where we were supposed to be doing exactly what we were supposed to be doing because it was all prepared before time. God knew a conference was going to be in Columbia that weekend, and we'd be there, and we get there. Now, what happens is when I don't obey, I stay home watching Netflix and eating popcorn and drinking wine. You know, whatever. Guess what happens? I'm not, I, I've had this thing inside of me, this gnawing thing. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. What is it? What's wrong? Why can't I enjoy this? Because you're not where you're supposed to be. And meanwhile, those guys got to carry double mantles because your mantle's not there. You're making the work, other people work harder. 
So we are his workmanship. See, never under, underestimate because you're God's workmanship. Never underestimate yourself. Don't ever not see that. If you speak neg negatively, listen to me, about yourself, pause, you're criticizing God's workmanship. Hmm. Let's say this stage is perfect. It almost is. And you know what? That's just, if that stage was just a little different color, it'd be better. And yet God said, I want it to be that color. Now I'm criticizing what God created. Wow, why, why didn't he, why did he make my rear end so big? Why, why did he make, you know, whatever your issue is, right? <laughs> your physical body is going to die. It's corruptible anyway. It's what's inside of you that matters, right? I know you want that. Why do you want that? Why do you want your body to be different? <laughs> your heads are spinning because I want somebody to look at me. I want somebody to like me. I want whatever. What's your reason for that? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. All right, here we go. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't take care of your body. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah. Remember that? Well, who's Popeye's wife? What was his, what was his name? Olive. Olive. Yeah, really. You know, I'm sure it, today she'd have all these shoulder pads and all this stuff, you know. Then she, yeah, honeymoon, it'd all be on the floor, be a pile, and the papa go, well, who are you? Anyway, all right. So never, <laughs> that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, the Greek word there for workmanship, now get this. The Greek word is poema, and it gives us the English word poem. So it suggests that you are God's creative masterpiece. And he wrote a poem about you. And when he created you, he had a whole song about you. Whew. Forget Edgar Allan Poe. How about Jesus Christ, the poet? And he wrote a song about you. And guess what? The angels get to hear that poem. And when they get assigned to you, they know the poem over your song, of your life. So they, have a, they know it, and they're looking at you and go, why don't you live out your poem? Well, I just don't like how he did this to me. Why didn't he give me more hair? Why didn't he do this for me? Why didn't he make me smarter? Why didn't he, why, 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 why? And you're looking at what you don't have rather than what you do have. And understand that what you do have will help you do what you're called to do. Focus on that. That's no excuse not to take care of yourself, but it is a place in us that we have to embrace and celebrate what he has put in us and not tear down what we don't like about what's, what we, who we are. And suggest a creative masterpiece. We are God's creative masterpiece. When God wanted to show the whole universe what he could really create, he decided on you. <laughs> The biggest art show in the world. And God has us as the art pieces. Except we're living. We're living art pieces. We're living stones is what the word says, right? The building the master plan of God. New Jerusalem, a city, is actually the bride of Christ. So it's not, it's a city, but it's not. What is a city? It's where people dwell. So we're the new Jerusalem where he will dwell. Isn't that good? He decided on us. Isn't that remarkable? <laughs> Lord, you made a mistake. You made a mistake. Now think about that. When you get an assignment from the Lord, how much hell do you go through in your brain worrying about what's about to happen? Mm-hmm. And so you start thinking about it, and by the time you get there, you're defeated before you even show up. Because you're not, you're not in thought about what God put in you. You're thinking about what you don't have abilities to do. <laughs> and you just need to lean on him. Because there's times, you know, I just like, Lord, I'm going to lean on him. I didn't even know I was teaching a prophetic workshop. And then the next thing you know, they came up to me, you got a prophetic workshop. I said, I do. <laughs> and I said, okay, okay, you know. Because the thing said team on the schedule. 
It had my name, but it said team, so I thought it was our whole team. I didn't realize it was me. <laughs> I didn't realize I was the team. And so we're at lunch, and Colombian time and American time are two, two different things. Colombian's like, it's three. We're eating lunch. And I said, the meeting says it started at three. Oh, that'll be fine. That's what they said. I said, okay. So I get there about 3.30, 3.45 in a room uh, about a little bit further than this, uh, well, about three-quarters of the size room, packed. They're waiting on me. And I realized, where's the team? <laughs> I said, you it. I was like, okay, come on, Jesus, just show up. And I mean, there are notepads, pens, let's go. And I'm like, I didn't even have my computer. I said, man, can you find my computer? <laughs> Maybe Jesus is in the computer and he'll come out, you know. <laughs> anyway, and so, and all of a sudden it blew up. The whole meaning blew up. What was in me came out of me and we gave what they needed for that moment. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jesus. That's how remarkable this thing is. So God's created masterpiece. He created for something. What he created for? Good works that he prepared before we were even here to walk in. That's the beauty of walking in the will of God. So he had to do that. And you don't have to sit down and ponder, what ought I do? <laughs> Wonder what I should do. Look, all you do is to ask God, what do you have for me to do? Mm hmm See, and some, some people are, you know, they need more directives. I get that. But, but how about, Lord, asking him, ask Lord, Lord, what do you have for me today? When you wake up in the morning, Lord, what's, the, what's your plan today? I have my plans. What's yours? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What if you've planned your whole day and he, he's like, he'd been nice to talk to me before you did all that. You ever do that in marriage, right? The, your spouse has plans all day and never told you? You're like, well, it would be nice. Let me know that, you know. Whatever. <laughs> no elbowing going on here, all right? <laughs> all right? So this is one of those things that we need to ask the Father what's on his heart that day. My favorite story is when Jesus is going to Jairus' house and the woman with issue blood touches him. And the disciples are like, we got to go to Jairus' house. We have a, we have a, it's on the schedule. It's been on the schedule for days. We're going. <laughs> and he says, stop. And, you know, and then Peter's like, look, Jesus, it's right here. At 10 o'clock, we're going to be at Jairus' house. Did you not know the schedule? He's German. And, and um, or he's, he's, you know, administrative. And he said, no, this is what we're doing right now because this is what the Father's doing right now. And so you've got to be willing to change your plans in a snap when God is doing something. And that drives people crazy. That's what drives them crazy. And so what he says, no, now, why? Why was that important? Because now we read about her, and we've been reading about her for 2,000 years. What if he said, well, the schedule, sorry, lady. Too bad. Too sad. We're going to Jairus' house. That's where we're going. And Jairus, he got there eventually, and Jairus got taken care of. Everything got taken care of. God can do all that. Now, think about that. I had a dream about that lady. The women, we were in Israel. We went to that place where the painting was and um, this last time. I had a dream about her later, and the Lord showed me she became an amazing evangelist after that and began to share her testimony and many came to the Lord. And I've done some study on early church history and found out that she was a very active person in the Spirit and began to do that. Isn't that cool? That God would do that for us? And that's a very important part. All right, let me close. I'll get out of here before it starts storming again. All right. Um, uh, just to ask him, like I said, there's not a single person here today created by Christ Jesus. There's not anybody here tonight or watching online that God does not have a specific work for you to accomplish. I want you to grab that. The promises of God are not vague. They're practical. One of the things that we get complimented about our teaching and prophetic and training and equipping people is they say, look, what y'all do for us is practical. We can actually do this stuff. You know, when we used to bring all the prophets in here all the time, they, they spoke in mystical terms all the time. 
I saw this eagle and an angel, and he was jumping off a mountain, you know, whatever. And you, you hear all this stuff, and it was powerful. I mean, you're like, whoa. But, like, what do we do with that, you know? You know, and so then we brought in some practical apostolic people, and I had one guy come up to me, he goes, I love these prophets, but that I can do <laughs> because that's practical. And our call over life is going to be practical. It's not going to be mystical. You understand that? It's not, he's not going to ask you to do something that's so mystical that you don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this. I just feel like this is God. No, it's going to be practical. It's going to change people. It's going to minister to the hurting. It's going to help those who are sick. It's going to help those who need deliverance. It's going to be very practical in its calling. So when you're trying to find out what it is, is what you're seeking going to be practical? Keep it really simple. Keep it simple. Stupid kiss, we call it. We call it that, right? And we do. And I used to add this saying, because me and my brother, I talked about last week, but he'd always want to argue theology with me. And we used to argue for hours and hours and hours on theology. And the Lord gave me a word for him one time, which he didn't appreciate. I said, don't get so intellectual that you miss the simplicity of God. Because it's very simple. You walk by faith and not by sight. You do what he asks you to do. Well, we need to understand why we're doing it. Well, I get that. I'm doing it because he asked me to do it. <laughs> and I'll learn what it's all about when I get there. Because when I get there, I'm like, aha, we have our aha moments. Aha, that's why I'm here. Now I'm in, in Sunday. I didn't have my aha in Columbia until Sunday. Aha, that's why I'm here. It all came together, and the next thing you know, I said, "Woo!" Because there was moments I thought I didn't need to be there. I remember I was preaching in, in Germany one time, and I got invited by somebody to speak there. And um, I, I just didn't feel right. I, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Why am I? And I went outside to pray, and I was like, Lord, what's going on? Am I, you know, and I, this is literally what I thought. These people don't know me. They've never met me. I could just leave. And they go, well, where'd the preacher go? It's like, he gone, man. <laughs> I live, that's what entered my brain. And I thought, Lord, what am I doing here? I don't understand why I'm here. This is not my stream. These people are not flowing in what I flow in at all. And I never forget. And so the, the person who invited me came out in the hall and says, what's wrong? I said, well, I'm just struggling a little. She says, you're wondering why you're here, aren't you? And I said, yeah, kind of am. She goes, because God told me you're supposed to be here. You're going to be able to help these people. I said, really? <laughs> That's good to know. So I'll never forget. I went back in, and I stood in that pulpit. And when I stood in that pulpit, boom, the anointing came. And next thing you know, I started flowing. And I gave them something that they didn't have, and then I recognized I needed what they had as well. And it was God. I was judging wrongly, and because I was judging wrongly, it became clouded of what I was supposed to be doing. So sometimes you can't, as I shared it sometime recently, <laughs> that you need that discernment in your spirit where even if it looks like a dark place, it may be a light. Or it may, if you think it's a light place, it may be a dark place. That's why it says in Hebrews 5.14 that we train our senses to discern good and evil. And so you cannot measure by what you see in the natural. Your spirit, when you're mature in the Lord, you'll be able to discern whether it's good or evil. It's like, hmm, this looks like it was going to be a great place, but it's really not, or vice versa. All right, let's stand up. Hurry before it rains. Now, y'all cannot stay late. You have to leave, all right, because we need to get y'all out of here before the next wave comes. I'm not watching. How's the radar look, babe? Have you looked? What's that? Okay. Ooh, it's right on us right now. So, Father, we pray protection over us again. We ask that, Father, tonight that we understand our calling. Lord, we thank you that we are your workmanship. Now make that confession. Say, I am, I am God's, workmanship. God's workmanship. I am God's creative masterpiece. And I will walk in what he created me to be. I'm just making sure everybody was lipping that. All right. That was recorded by heaven. And so when you doubt it, God will play that tape recorder again. Well, I remember on that Wednesday night, son, when daughter, when you said that, you know, well, pastor made me say it. 
Jehovah Sneaky, come on, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for what you're doing tonight for your purpose. Keep our community safe again, Lord. We pray that. And, Lord, I pray that every person in this room will walk out their prophetic calling and all that they're called to do. In the name of Jesus, we send them out. Amen and amen.